always the worst part. <laughs> I know, right? Waiting for stuff. There it goes. There we go. There we are. Okay, welcome everyone. We are live. Welcome to uh, AAC in the Cloud 2020. Uh, we have a great presentation for you. Oh, before we do that, we're in track three. So if you're watching this video, make sure you switch over to track three. Otherwise, you'll be commenting on the wrong, uh, the wrong presentation. So we have a really interesting presentation for you from Kelly Fonner on using alternative pencils. So I'm going to kick this right over to Kelly and we will jump right in. All right. Well, hi, everybody. If you were like I, I was in two rooms at the same time. So here we go. Uh, my name is Kelly Fodder. I do training and consulting and educational assistive technologies. I'm really glad to um, be here at AAC in the cloud. And I'm always so grateful for them for putting this event on. I'm going to switch over to the presentation. The presentation, I put the link in the Slack. So you should be able to see that. It's also be on a couple of the, the slides. It's just bit.ly slash fauner dash or underscore alt pencils. So um, if you're just coming out of the wonderful session from Laura Hayes, where I was, um, I think that these sessions are going to be complementary of each other. And if you didn't see it, go back and watch her one on AAC and writing because it'll be able to um, give you some of the what you do and developing piece. And I'm talking about the what are alternative pencils and how are they used. My background is as a special education teacher. I've been in the field for 30 some years and have been doing assistive technology for pretty much from the moment I stepped into special education because I've always been working with children and students and young adults who have complex needs. And writing is something that as a teacher, I really love teaching writing. Some people don't, um, but it was one of the passions that I had with my students because I could really see their progress. So I wanna share here today um, information on using different modalities for writing, including their communication system, exploring a variety of these alternative pencils and then what to do with them. What kind of supports are out there for you? Um, one of the persons that I follow in the area of writing and been using many of her strategies are, is Dr. Janet Sturm um, and the first author curriculum and some of the other uh, beginning writing for complex communicators and individuals with complex needs. And one of the things that we've learned that from Janet and from others is that symbol-based writing doesn't lead to conventional writing. And I know that it get, it's very popular thing to do for people to have symbols and then touch symbols and have those go into words. But if we're looking for kids to learn the process of writing, they need to have access to an alphabet. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not using symbols for some parts of the writing process, but if you really want them to learn the conventions of spelling and the conventions of putting sentences together, the best way to do it is with the real letters, but we've got to get those real letters to everybody. So do you have a print rich environment? You know, whether you're in homeschool or what we call Zoom school now with a couple of my students, um, what does it look like around you? Are you promoting writing or is writing like, ah, like, oh, now we have to write. Um, if you're like that, then your students are gonna be that way too. If you're like that with your child, then they're not gonna wanna write either. So what we really wanna do is see how we can make it fun how we can make writing connected to what you want to write about. Because if you have a difficult time for writing, you should write about the things that you love. And that's another one of the Dr. Sturm's quotes. So let's talk about these alternative pencils. People hear a lot about alternative pencils. You can do a Google search on alternative pencils. You'll find alternative pencils on teacher pay teacher. Um, and so they work in lots of different ways because there are all kinds of alternative pencils whether they're things that are virtually on the screen, things that adapt the writing implement, things that replace writing as alternatives. And we'll do a little walk through of some of those supports. I always like to stick in these reminders of there are things that you can do with traditional tools that can help kids. Um, and I have kids that are using mouth wands and head sticks um, as well as, and putting those traditional tools into head sticks for coloring with markers and things that can help support their writing development and going through those stages of writing. 
other kinds of helpers, whether you're using um, a handheld implement or you're using another alternative pencil, is having models around you. You know, sometimes in classrooms, we have those models that are way up um, in the sky. And I have kids I can't see up there. Uh, so you need to bring some things closer to kids. So whether you're getting one that's pre-made or make your own um, in lesson picks or board maker or symbol sticks, you can work on having something more close up as a model. For some other kids that are trying to have, you know, to write by hand as well as we're working on writing electronically. And I've got a couple kids that are in this mix where they really, you know, they see everybody else using their hands to write. Um, and so we look at what are the supports that we can do through raised papers, through writing templates, but at the same time, we're giving them access to alternative pencils that might be partner assisted or electronic. So it, you know, we can have both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can make your own, uh, uh, you know, because race line paper can get pretty expensive. Uh, and so you can make your own race line paper or make visual supports by highlighting every other line. Um, I have uh, one student that we worked with through a project that she did not prefer to use her closed circuit TV. But when we were during writing time and she could see what she was writing and she could see what other people were writing, it really became the best time for the vision um, itinerant to come in the room and help her out. Other things just to stabilize paper and you know, know that there are supports out there for writing. I have a lot of teachers that use the handwriting without tears as a support in their classroom if they don't have occupational therapy support, the Therapro handwriting helpers, the all right curriculum. And also from um, Bridget Nicholson, she just had an article in the Closing the Gap journal that about um, the assessment that she's put together that looks at these four areas of writing um, and how to move forward with them. So looking at handwriting, looking at typing with and without the keyboard, whatever type of keyboard it may be, using voice recording as you're writing and using speech recognition. And when we get into the second part of this about why do we do what we do, that makes a difference between whether we're doing that letter by letter or maybe I need to get something in a content area written out, I need to fill in a worksheet. Um, I can do that in the fastest modality that's available to me because I don't want cognitive energy of how to print being in competition with, comp with cognitive energy for what I'm putting on the paper. So I know it sounds confusing, but it, it does work itself out. Um, some alternatives that are really easy alternatives are things like stamps and stencils. And if you're marking a paper, bingo markers and um, name stamps. If you have one of these little label writers and somebody can type them out, it's sticky on the back so you can stick it right on. So when you look at tasks that just need to be completed, um, using these kinds of alternatives are not about teaching a child to spell, but how do you write when you're, this is the writing situation, when the task is to mark a paper, when the task is to fill in the blank, those kinds of things can be done in the easiest way possible. We also do things, whether we're working on phonic activities like making words activities, or we're working on building letters, we're working on word wall activities. We do this with letter cards, letter tiles that kids might glue into place. Um, if you um, have magnetic letters, they get used for lots of different processes in learning how to write, as well as can become a very simple alternative pencil for a beginner. When we start looking at your alternative pencil might be your iPad or your Galaxy tablet or some you know, tablet that's writing, looking at some of these alternative stylus which one might work better with your particular tools or another. There's um, on a Google, Google site for the average tech guy, and he's been reviewing all of the current um, Apple pencils. So I can't do it any better than he can. So do, do a search on them and you can see those and see all the five or six ones that he shows and where they're from. Some of the things I get more involved with when we're looking at typing on on-screen keyboards are stylus. Uh, enabling devices has a variety of stylus uh, and InfoGrip has a variety of stylus that you'll see that sometimes 
you know, with the, the young man that's in the upper right corner picture where he's using a stylus as a, a mouth wand as his stylus. Sometimes I have people that they use mouth wands because they can pick them up. You know, it can be in a dock, they can pick those up and use it and they don't have to depend upon somebody else to connect them up with everything. Now, of course, we need to talk about health and safety and sanity, um, sanity, sanitation of, of mouth wands. But sometimes I have a student that uses a mouth wand just to turn on the computer so that he can be more independent when he goes to write. Of course, alternative pencils, alternative keyboards, that idea of replacing the standard keyboard with something else that might be enlarged, it might be miniaturized, you might be using a brailler um, as your keyboard. And we're gonna show you some examples um, via video as well. I need to make sure that you're gonna hear my sound. And I've given you the, for the videos, because I'm not gonna be able to show all of the videos in their full length, um, I've given you the links so that you can also replay them in your own time. From the Pacer Center. Hi, my name is Mason. Mason is six years old. Uh, he enjoys a variety of things. He likes music. This instrument is called a ukulele. Uh, he also enjoys playing the Wii. Uh, he loves bowling and tennis, and he also loves uh, dance party, he calls it, just dance. Uh, it's uh, hard for him to follow along with uh, movements, but he just dances and has a good time. That, that, that's about my favorite game. Mason is visually impaired. Uh, he actually is blind in his left eye, and in his right eye he has partial retina that he uses to see with. With that retina that he has intact, he can see about 2300 vision uh, compared to the normal 2020. We are a normal family, and I'm Mason- I'm gonna fast forward it to where Mason is using his Mountbatten Brailler and you'll hear his vision itinerant talking in the background. Ah, no, I didn't. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes, AAC in the cloud. That's the way plans. The classroom Mason uses his mouth pattern, um, as far as technology goes, mostly for writing activities. So anytime the teacher has the students doing pencil paper writing, Mason uses his mouth pattern. You go one, two, three, four, five, six. You just press down these keys. When you type something, it will tell you what you typed. C -A -C -A. It's like bumps, like bumps you read. So the Mountbatten Brailler was new to us last year. Um, the school district here has been fabulous about providing technology and any other accommodations that we've requested. So the, the school district purchased the Mountbatten for Mason to use as long as he needs it. He can read some large print, but Again, uh, at this point- Again, if you want to watch more of Mason and all the other great things that he does, I have another video of a child younger than Mason using the Mountbatten Brailler. So, you know, one of the alternative keyboards as we look electronically at ele alternative keyboards are things that are virtual, things that are on the screen. You know, if you've got an iPad, you've got a tablet, you've got a large screen monitor with a keyboard on it, sometimes those arrangements will work, but sometimes it doesn't work out for kids visually, or it's a challenge as to where the letters might be or it's just a challenge size-wise, and having the voice output can be helpful. So looking at these different kinds of virtual keyboards or sometimes called third-party keyboards that get added into the iPad as an app, and then you bring them up through the keyboard um, settings. So things like super keys that are grouped, that are enlarged, you'll see those kinds of supports. Kidogo that adds speech to non-speech generating apps but you can add speech to it. Um, and that can be that helpful feedback loop. When we also look at alphabets, look at the alphabet that you might already have. So the alphabet that might be in your low tech or high tech AAC system. And we, you know, having been somebody that's worked with kids with AAC for a long time, you know, I've learned 
that we need to have access to an alphabet. We hear people talk about that's how I can make unique words, but that's also how you can start to learn to spell. If you don't think that your child or your student is a speller, how do you know unless you put the alphabet in front of them? You know, you've got to have it to be able to model it and to use it. So you'll see all different kinds of alphabets. And as I said, go to Laura's session to get a little bit more with the AAC alphabet um, and alternative pencil connection. But things are built into grid and things are built into many, most of the apps that are available from all of the companies. So that some are based upon the alphabet, products like WordPower that have different arrangements, whether you're a direct selector or a scanner. This is a scanning arrangement that's on the screen here. Um, but also you'll see a grid has lots of different alphabet layouts and some will have just, you know, a basic QWERTY layout and some will have an alphabetical layout. Some products that have um, switch access might have frequency layouts and we'll talk a little bit more about those things. When you're using your AAC system for writing, and I love this from a colleague of mine, Kristen Gray, um, who works with a young man and he loves to send us surveys and we've been getting surveys from um, a student, a client of hers for about three years. And one of the things that Kristen will do in his surveys so that those of us that are in the field, I mean, most of his surveys are going to family that, you know, doesn't matter how it's being produced. But for those of our, us that are trying to learning and, and watch his progression in his writing, she uses this process. Um, and so in the survey and in the um, emails that he sends to you, things are underlined if they were produced word by word or through whole phrases on his AAC system. If he spoke them and somebody dictated it in, it's italicized. Um, if it's in just plain letters, it's choices that he that were made um, by the scribe to add clarity to it. So having some type of a writing key or writing guide can be very helpful when, especially when you have multiple people that might be looking at a child's writing for different purposes. All right, so what about the kids that can't touch? What about the kids that can't, you know, touch a, a screen on their D AAC device or can't hold an implement or an adapted implement? Well, we talked a little bit about dictation and how some people might use dictation. They might use recording so that information is recorded for longer presentations. Um, some children will use dictation in that they drew a picture and then they tell you what it is. And so this idea of writing, of draw and write, can then get sol more solidified when you start having them write about what their picture is so that we don't always use this kind of I think Dr. David Copenhaver talks about one of the most overused accommodations in writing for kids in special needs classrooms is the the dictate the draw dictate write so that the kid picks a picture they tell a staff person what that picture is about and then the staff person writes it. And then sometimes it goes on that the kid has to trace it. This is not learning to write. It's getting your ideas out. And so there are situations where I wanna get my ideas out, but it's not about learning to be able to be a speller and writer. So some of the things about kids with dictation, make sure that um, if you are a scribe, I try to call people a scribe because that really puts the job um, right in place for them. As a high school resource teacher, I had several students that we scribed for, and I would have other, their um, inclusion teachers would say, well, whose work is this? This is in somebody else's handwriting. You know, this is it in Jason's handwriting. This is it in Emily's handwriting. So when one of the things that we did, as you see here with this student, is played um, a recording while the student was dictating to us so that the recorded file went along with the printed file, especially if we had to do things like test taking um, and other kinds of academic materials that had to be turned in to their teacher. So the teacher could listen and hear that it really was that child's words, whether they were producing them vocally or they were producing them 
through their AAC system. So when you do have this process of using your voice, because a lot of people say, oh, well, my kid can speak well, so I'm going to use that as their alternative to write. The idea of speaking and the idea of expressive print can be complicated. And just putting a child in front of, you know, a click speaker and start talking is the same as a child who prints or types having a blank page. So we have this process that we have to, that kids go through of, let me think about what I have to write. I have to compose it and maybe use some things like sentence starters and other kinds of word banks and word maps to help out the narrated typer. We have kids that do eye typing as their alternative pencil. So whether this is something that they use built into their electronic eye gaze system. So we go through the calibration process. They have an alphabet of, you know, within their page sets, or maybe they have another page set or another app that they go into. That's the alphabet. Looking at eye gaze, just like being able to talk to communicate and how that's different to write. It's the same thing with eye gaze, being able to look around and look at things to communicate is different than writing with your eyes. And so sometimes people will do things like playing games to get kids into eye gaze patterns. But one of the best ways that I found is that if I want a kid to use your know, practice or try out using their eyes to write, uh, we write, like that's what we do. We start with alphabet letters, they're looking around at them and whatever they type, we look at that as the scribbling phase. So I'm going through and I'm clicking on the letters that are going to be my writing tool of the future. Um, whether, you know, just because I'm using technology doesn't mean that you have to do it perfectly. And I think that too often people put that upon um, augmentative communicators and alternative writers that, okay, here's this keyboard, spell your name. Like that, I'm not ready to spell my name. I'm ready to poke around and hit a couple keys of lots of times. And I'm going to show you some samples from kids who are using alternative pencils um, and how we just got started by introducing them, modeling how mom writes, how I write, and doing that. So yes, playing games and kind of following the, the eye gaze curve may be helpful in solidifying eye gaze skills, but if I want to write by eyes, I'm going to write by eyes. And keep it basic. So many people talk about it, um, Lynn did as well, the alternative pencils from Gretchen Hanser and the Center on Literacy and Disability Studies. And we'll also see, I have examples of alternative pencils from Caroline Musselwhite and from Linda Burkhart. And so it's the idea of how do I get that alphabet, all 26 letters and punctuation and commands such as keep going and stop, I'm done with that, oh, backspace. So it's a little bit more than just the letters that we need to get to people. Um, how do I get that to somebody who does eye gaze? How do I get that to somebody who needs to have them auditorily said to them or use a highlighter or a pencil or a flashlight to point to each letter so they can say, oh, that's the one I want um, in whatever way they indicate that's the one they want. So you'll, um, we've got the link here. If you don't know, the alternative pencil sites have been expanded um, since Project Core has begun. So you'll, if you can't find an alternative pencil there, whoo, I'm surprised. So let's give an example of somebody that's using an alternative pen pencil. Now this is someone, um, this is Zoe, who's using a pencil that's built into her printed pod book. And so you'll see an example actually from one of my other students um, in the upper right hand corner of all of the pages. So this is, shows you how some of the grouped alternative pencils look and work. Look back here. We're just gonna look, look, look. When I first met Zoe, she hadn't been introduced to the alphabet yet in her communication book, but the other kids in her class were doing some writing. So we wanted to make sure that we could give her the same opportunity that other kids in her class were having. Um, one of the things that you, you see that their um, team used is they used a flashlight. Oh, 
I have a green flashlight, so it doesn't work with the background. Um, and so she could highlight just so that make sure that she will look. Um, she has cortical vision impairment. So we wanna make sure that she looks across all of the options. So this was the very first time that she was introduced to it. Those are all <laughs> the alphabet. <gasps> They're all back here. All of them. And if I go here, I get to turn a page <gasps> and they're bigger. So in a grouped alphabet, you have the alphabet by sections. In this case, it's an alphabetical order alphabet. And then once the section is chosen, you turn to that page or you flip to that page and you have the items laid out. In Zoe's case at this point, she didn't have a, a consistent selection method. So things like clapping, things like raising her hands up, sometimes she would hit the book. So all of those things were acceptable at this point. Just like when you put a crayon or a marker and a two-year-old's hand who's physically can hold it and they scribble everywhere. You're telling them, oh, look what you've done and oh, you've made this. And so it's the same thing when we get kids access to their alphabet. You can go to this website and get more information on um, and see more of this video. <laughs> so the idea of alternative pencils, couple different ways of them in eye gaze, when you see things group like that, it, there's usually a two to three part gaze that happens where first the child looks to the group and then they look to their writing partner who's gonna confirm, oh, you're looking up here. And then depending upon how many are in each group, often they're color coded as you see in this example. And now the second look is to the color. So if I wanna type start typing the word the, I'm gonna look over to my side and I'll look back at my writing partner who will point to where they believed I was looking at. And then because I'm starting with the letter T, I'm gonna to look to the orange corner. So this kind of two part scan, um, eye gaze system is something that you'll see either built into some systems or standalone. In the case of the flip books, you usually are starting with um, the beginning of the alphabet and flipping through and working through that process of, you know, I want something from this page. I don't want something from this page. When they are indicating I want something from that page, then you go through it letter by letter. Whether or not you use your voice um, tends to be managed based upon the amount of vision that a child has. Now, I'm not saying the word cognition because one of the things of kids learning that use the alphabet is to learn the letters by having them. Somebody says them out loud. They either print them, they type them somehow. So if I'm always saying I, J, K, L, I'm now part of their selection system. If they need that visually, that's great. But how do you learn your communication system? by using it and having it modeled. Same thing with learning the alphabet, by using it and having it modeled and by doing different activities with it. Sometimes you'll see these alphabet um, laid out in a way that there might be a space at the beginning of all of them. You might have some more of the commands rather than a page at the end, that's the command. But the idea is for somebody to be selecting. So we have to work on selection method. One of the selection methods that um, Gretchen Hanser talks about is if I have a red switch and a green switch, if a child keeps hitting the green switch, I keep moving to the next one. So green means go, red means that's the one I want. So you can move, 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 pick, move, 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 pick. Um, and begin that step scanning process in a low tech way. They might be using that step scanning process eventually to do their own typing and writing. So here's an example of an alternative pencil um, on the We Speak Pod family. They've got lots of nice writing examples because they've got kids that are at different stages of writing. So this is the pencil and you've got a link here to Linda Burkhart's website um, for this alternative pencil. 
Angela, I have something to say. I'm telling you something. Yep, it's about now. School activities. Oh, mommy's looking upside down. School activities, turn the page. We're gonna do some writing. Some really special activity writing. Back to page one. Sorry, that's back to categories. We are going to give somebody a birth certificate. Activities, toys, your baby doll. We need to give baby a name. So one of the things that we talk about writing and whether it's, you know, and whatever strategy that you're using is what's the purpose? Why am I writing? Not just writing to practice writing the letters, but I'm writing for real reasons. And so a lovely way that Karen sets up that they're going to do this baby's birth certificate. And I'm going to fast forward us here to getting into using the pencil. Are you ready? Yes, you are ready. You will see with Karen, her daughter um, a, selects, B, C, sometimes by B, a nod, e. sometimes with her voice. It's not moving. No. F, G, H, I, J. And Angela does have cortical vision impairment, so you hear Karen saying the letters. Thinking? Yes. F. So the first scan through is to G. say all of the letters on the page and find out whether you I see a little yes. Can I have a big yes, stay on please? that page? Yes. G. And then... Did you make a mistake? You have operationals. No. Do you have another letter? I see little yeses. Can I see a big yes, please? Yes. All right. Let's write down G. This is to certify that G. So again, you can go to the We Speak Pod Facebook or YouTube channel and type in Angela and alternative pencils and see some other examples. Angela, there's another good example of a different style of all of alternative pencil. I do not know this child, this um, particular student, but I think it gives you a great example of setting the stage for writing and somebody using their voice as their selection method. I got something fun we're going to try today, and we're going to write a story about the pumpkin patch. You went to the pumpkin patch today, didn't you, at the farm? And would you like to write some words about it? Yeah, I saw a blank. Yes, okay, let's do. Look, I have some letters on this page. Do you see my letters? Here's the letter A, B, C. And D, would you like for me to write one of those words for you? You want to choose one of those letters, I meant? Or you want to turn the page and find a different letter? Would you like the letter A? Do you want me to write an A? No. You want to write a B? Yes. Okay. I'm going to make a B for you. B is our first letter. Excellent. See the letter B? What do you want to write next? You want to write another B? One of the things I would just like to add when you're doing any kind of partner assisted scanning is the less of us, the more of your student, the more of your child. So rather than asking things as a question, like, do you want to write the letter B? Just to say B, or if you have to say write B, you know, it's, it's better just to name the letters off as you saw in the example of Karen with Angela, 
just because that's gonna, you know, rather than answering a question, it's more like a selection. If I was always to say to you, do you want a letter A? Do you want a letter B? Do you want a letter C? Do you want a letter D? You know, I'm not. <laughs> so if you just say A, B, C, and move through that alphabet that way. Um, so again, nice example of how we're use different selection methods. I think sometimes people have this idea that everybody's got to touch something or everybody's going to say, yes, that's what I want. Um, it's, you know, you're going to find and, and make your way with that. I mean, that's part of the process of learning to write is how do I select the letters that I'm going to be writing with. Um, with several of the students that I work with, we've moved through, even just since January, moved through three different ways of selecting letters. And you're going to see him here in a little bit. If you're going to be doing anything with switch access, layout's going to be key. There's a question and, and comment on the Slack about layouts. And what I try to do um, is look at what will be their tool in the future and build our way that way. So if there's somebody that's going to be interacting with a QWERTY keyboard um, more often than not, then we're going to start with a QWERTY keyboard. Um, I do know kids that have transitioned from alphabet keyboards to QWERTY keyboards, but if I know that and think or think that that's the direction we're going, that's the way to start. Just like you know, starting out in a language communication system with all of the messages and then doing masking, so that I don't mess up the idea of motor planning. So with kids that are scanning, we're looking at motor planning in a big way. Um, we're looking at motor planning based upon what's gonna be the most frequently used letter. It might be what um, letters are they most familiar with, you know, the layout that they know and how I'm moving them into the scanning process. But you have to take frequency into account. And there's a nice article at the ACE Center um, about switch scanning and frequency layouts and other some examples with that. The other thing too is get those switches mounted. So whether you're using a switch in the green red way or you're using a switch to activate a scanning array, don't be holding their switch. We as humans move, we are not a mounting system. Um, and so one of the ways to get consistent and that people that you've seen do typing that are that are terrifically timed. There's some nice examples on the AssistiveWare website of people using um, switches that of you know ring finger switches, Fizio switches, other kinds of switches, and their speed is because they know where everything is in their scan. Um, that people haven't mixed it up over time, or in the case of some adults, that they have developed their own writing scan as well. So here's an example of, um, it's one of my old, oldies but goodies, of a two-switch step scanner. And she's writing her um, list to Santa Claus. And we'll have to get that connected later. Uh, if you don't have the handout, the handout's right here on this page at bit.ly Fawner, um, alt pencils. So there's some examples of alternative pencils. Let's talk a little bit more about how they're used. When you have this idea of writing time, um, try and set it up so that your child is picking the topic. Again, kind of following the principles from first author. If they don't like to write or they struggle to write, they need to pick what it is. And part of the process of writing is coming up with an idea. So connecting the expressive part to the producing of letters. I so wanted somebody to produce letters randomly it should be connected to a topic. So learning to pick topics, you know, with kids that are scribbling, they draw stuff and then they tell you what that might be. So when we have children that can't necessarily draw um, with their tools, but we use their alternative pencil as a way of scribbling and a way of drawing. And then with their communication system or with their voice, describe what it is that they wrote. Pictures can anchor what it is that you, you wrote. I show you a video here from one of my um, virtual sessions with Zoom School, 
with Mason. You can find out more about Mason um, and actually almost all of his family um, on Mason's milestones and communicating with Pod. If you watch the pre-conferences for AAC in the Cloud, Mason's dad um, is one of the presenters in the dad group. So Mason is 10. He has Pitt Hopkins syndrome. Um, he hadn't had a lot of instruction on literacy prior to being um, pulled from school and, and being homeschooled. And so some of the things that we're working through are core words and core vocabulary, and we're working our way through the process of scribbling with your alternative pencil. And since January, um, he's used about three or four different alternative pencils. Started out with the one that was in his pod book. We moved to another layout in his pod book. And now he's using that Linda Burkhart alternative pencil. Mason also has a cortical vision impairment. Still, yes, one of those. Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Mason, I don't know. You're building a good one. I, something's wrong, uncomfortable, food and drink. Mm. Uh, hurry up. Is that what you're saying? Hurry up? Are you saying hurry now, Mason's up? Mason's another one who's still working on a selection method. Um, and he also has, he has got a lot of sensory movement all the time. So as you're watching him for the first time, um, don't take his movement side to side as always being yes and no. Look more at, he does have a yes and no symbols on his um, tray. He has, oh, he will also just do a select by reaching out and touching the book. So we'll be hurried up so you can get some food. <laughs> yeah, 51A. There you go. There, Mommy found your letters. There we go. Look, here's your letters. And then what Miss Kelly's going to do is switch over to something where I'm going to type all the thing, all the letters that you pick. Ooh. Oh. Oh, look here, Mace. Look what so got. here in virtual school, I'm also trying to model for families what they can do. And we have a, we now have writing portfolios set up um, in, um, in Google Slides. So I've got slide decks for them to put in a picture of the writing or a picture of the topic and then add the writing. Mm. Oh, they need to be bigger. So yes, this was the topic are. that he chose. He yes. chose actions and look looking at our letters. At are we gonna spell something? <gasps> you gonna write like we did before? <laughs> All right. So we'll start scanning and see what letters you pick to write about your topic. I'm gonna write action. about looking. Actions look okay. Are you ready? Things you like to look at. Okay, ready? A, B, C, D, E. One of those. No. F, G, H, I, J. One of those. K-L-M-N-O, one of those. P-Q-R-S-T, one of those. So as you can tell, Leslie has a pattern that she goes through. She's got a nice pacing so that she says all the letters that are in the column and then waits. And she waits for something that's either going to indicate that's the one I want or she has a, you know, a period of time that she waits. If he doesn't even give her a no, she keeps going. Oh, was that a yes? Yes. Okay, great. You chose P Q R S T. All right, ready? P. Yes. P. Our first letter. Right. P. 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 P.
Okay, ready? Now we're ready for our second letter. A, B, C, D, E, one of those. Oh, you're touching your book. So you've seen a. a couple different selection methods. He's selected by voice, he's selected by touch. Um, and you can go to their website and see some more of the videos. You can also see videos of him writing with um, friends, with his cousins, um, and his brothers. Still. So yeah. One of the curriculum that I've been following um, with people and, you know, self-disclosure, I do do some training for Don Johnston, but in my individual work with students, I use this curriculum. Um, and so we've been doing the mini lessons um, and we were doing them before Zoom school and now um, where we talk about choosing topics, we give time to write, and then we also celebrate our writing. So don't forget that writing for a purpose is also about sharing your writing, whether it's through social media or through author's chair kinds of activities. So having that opportunity to scribble and, and whether you're scribbling and using an app like Chili Paint or Glow Draw or some of the apps where you can stamp things around, it's getting your ideas out. And we use communication systems to talk about our idea. And then we write or we draw whatever way and whatever kind of an adaptation, all the adaptations that we might use. I mentioned too earlier, this is from a colleague of mine, Don, uh, Donna McNair. She gets kids started really young, you know, with whatever the tool is of their future. So here's little Ethan, who's just a year old, who is blind, who is learning all about his Mount Batten Brehiller. I'm not having luck with some videos today. Sorry, guys. And so what Ethan is, does is taps, taps, taps. He has his mom and his brother that are talking about what writing is, encouraging him to keep writing. And he moves between the keys of the Mountbatten and the Braille. So he moves between, so he sees what he produces. So as we move through kind of writing development and, you know, when kids that are using writing tools start to make shapes that look like letter-like forms, they might start making letter strings and have these kinds of draw, writing where a half draw and half write. So this is what um, I've been following along with some of my students. So I'm going to show you an example from um, Creedy's writing. As I said, I have made um, portfolios and now I have to check in that you can actually see this. Somebody can just give me a little sh shot out on the Slack if you are seeing writing by Creedy. And we keep, we've kept track. When I first met her, she was using um, word by word writing. So she had word banks that she was writing from and she was also doing fill in the blank writing with predictable charts. Okay, so no, you're not seeing that. So let me stop. This is the fun thing about sharing on Zoom and switching applications as we go. Now that should be up there. Uh, and so she was had started here where uh, things were given to her from school to write about. And can I enlarge it? Yes, I can. Let's present it. Oh, there you go. And so you know, she picks topics and she writes letters. And we have found over time, and sometimes she's writing on an eye gaze board, and sometimes she's writing with her grid. She's got a Toby eye gaze system with grid. And so she's got a grouped alphabet that she writes with. And she moves between those two. And her mom keeps track on the side what, what letters coming from which one. She started using spaces because we were giving examples of spaces in our modeling and we were doing lessons on using spaces to make words. But during her free writing time, that's what she's doing. She is writing the letter by letter using whichever mode she chooses. You'll see there's, and what one of the assessments that we follow in the um, developmental writing scale is looking at her topics, looking at her use of letters, the uniqueness of her letters. I'll just click on a couple more. I'll get you up to one of the really, there's one day that she was very excited about writing 
and we got three, almost 300 letters. So, you know, she, she's got a topic that she really likes about the letters just keep coming. And what we've started to do is find these patterns in her writing, like B-E and G-O. And those are words and uh, those are letters that we use in some of her phonic activities, some of her making words letters, so that she's using um, letters that she's selecting with. Um, and then we're just keeping track of which letters that she's writing with. When she uses her grid, sometimes she picks words from the word predictor. And I'll see if I can find, I'm clicking through these really quickly, but I'll find one that shows you from word prediction. So her mom calls them auto words. So if she picks that from her word bank or from her words, then um, her word list that they get indicated that way. We're still doing pra other practices. And one of the things that's really made a great impact, and I'm gonna quick quit out of here, is um, that she is sharing her writing with an electronic virtual friend. And that has been something that has been really special. And the girls will, um, I've paired her up with a colleague of mine's granddaughter, um, and they write together and they read, shared story reading um, together and they'll write and then they'll share their writing when they come back together and we meet once a week. So when you're doing things like free writing, try to be clear uh, your head of demands and expectations. Um, be excited about the things that they produce. Um, you'll, I'll show you, some, yes. I'll get some links. To She's some going to like words <laughs> and favorite. <laughs> Friends are her favorite. And you know what, Millie? Yesterday, we had a writing topic. We chose, my writing topic is school friends. And doing our writing in first author. So we've been picking time. So we have lessons. We kind of follow, oh, this is bad to see. We kind of follow this path of we say our hellos. We chat a little bit. We share our writing. And sometimes we do writing together. So, you know, we always run out of time in these, these sessions, um, but some other purposes and some other building of skills for writing is doing modeled writing. You know, whether you have a big group or a small group, you know, writing so that we can talk about it as we write, we see what words are, we can write books. Um, again, sharing our purpose for writing and shared topics. Um, I've given you a whole list of examples of apps and software programs that people use to write books. Um, you'll see some more YouTube videos of people writing. And this is a nice example of somebody that's writing a card to someone, to writing a letter and a card. I have something to say. Let's do something else. Let me go to categories. Event. All right, they're talking about a special event, and then I just want you to see an example of the pencil that they're using is one of the flip books Space. from the Project Core. Lever. And you know, Space. what I love about this video, I and what I love about this video is that they just stay with it. You know, she's got go get the wiggles out and comes back. But we don't all complete a writing task all at one time. So we shouldn't demand that of others. Some other things that can be supports for when you have content writing that you're doing is things like using word banks and word clouds and word prediction. Uh, shared writing, again, if you write surveys that people write back to you is a lot of fun. Um, some other writing strategies, language experiences, and Laura went through this really well with the idea of predictable charts. The only thing I caution about predictable chart writing is sometimes people get stuck here and they think that that's all it is, um, is let me start a sentence and you fill it in. And we need to get into the letter by letter writing that it's not all pre-started. If you have to deal with worksheets, you know, find a way to deal with worksheets as easy as you can um, and make sure that you're providing opportunities to communicate. So we have quickly, quickly run out of time here. 
here's some nice examples from Janet about what things you shouldn't be doing during writing. If it looks like somebody else did it, it probably was done by somebody else. Um, so as I think it's the biggest one in all of it. And then if you're looking for some ideas on assessment, you'll see some more information in the handout. So I'm gonna turn it back to the AAC in the cloud folks. If I can get my video back here. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully you guys can at least hear me. Um, thank you, Kelly, so much. That was such great information. All totally brand new to me, so I loved it. Um, and thank you guys all for attending. There is a link for the survey um, in the Slack track three. It's also on the AAC in the Cloud website, so make sure you fill that out. And um, again, Kelly, thank you so much, and everyone enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. If you have any questions, just email. <laughs> okay, thank you.